All right, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and uh, get started with tonight's Square Lens Education Society webinar with the uh, great Dr. Tom Arnold, Technology and the Square Lens Practice. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight, which is uh, Dr. Tom Arnold. Dr. Arnold is a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry. During his training, he participated in vision outreach programs in Mexico, Guatemala, uh, and with the Bureau of Indian Health Service. His externship was completed at the IHS Hospital in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he spent two years as a research assistant for the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study, EDT, uh, ETDRS study, at the University of Texas uh, School of Medicine. He opened his Today's Vision practice in Sugarland, Texas in 1992. Currently, Dr. Arnold is the Vice President of the Board of Today's Vision Licensing Corporation. Dr. Arnold was passionate about scleral contact lenses and their ability to help patients struggling with compromised vision related to the cornea. Uh, he is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, he, along with Dr. Nate Schramm, organized and moderated the inaugural uh, International Congress of Scleral Contacts in Miami Beach in July 2016. The ICSE was the first meeting in the world dedicated solely to scleral contact lenses. As an international speaker, Dr. Arnold has presented at meetings in the United Kingdom, South Africa, India, Jordan, Colombia, Italy, and Russia. And with that, I will turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Arnold. Thank you very much, Drew, and, and thank you, uh, Scarlet Lens Education Society, for uh, having me and, and asking me to do this presentation. Very, very grateful and appreciate the support of everyone there. And let's go in the right direction. These are my disclosures. Uh, hang out with some of these people and uh, help them with their their inquiries and, and products and uh, also a member of the uh, GPLI advisory board. So uh, I, th I think one of the things about scleral lenses is that you have to keep an open mind and not get lulled into a sense of complacency. I love this quote from Stephen Hawking about you know the the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance it's the illusion of knowledge and you know, I tell my externs uh, and, the, and the people that come to visit, you know, to keep an open mind. Uh, when I was at the early treatment, I'd, the ETDRS, <laughs> early treatment diabetic retinopathy study, the uh, noted retina specialist that I work for always talked about being a good observer, you know, being a good observer and keeping an open mind. So uh, I think uh, I learn something on scleral lenses every day, which is why they're fun. So scleral lenses, uh, is this really, we're talking about technology, is this something new? Or maybe maybe it's not so new, maybe it's something old, let's find out. This girl is wearing glasses. Don't believe it, but it's true, and here's how it's done. To make contact lenses, the eye is anesthetized, then Sydney optician Edwin Thomas, Australia's only contact lens maker, inserts the impression cut containing the material for taking a cup. The bowl sets in two minutes and then it's removed. A perfect impression. Contact lenses are a boot to actors, are worn by several film stars, jockeys, and actors. Yes, even glasses are made for today. Now the cast is put into a press and the plastic lens itself is molded. The lens is shaped to fit a square as I, and also to give the same visual correction or aid that would be given by normal glasses. Mm. Now the lens is cut to shape from the plastic. And it's ready for grinding. The plastic is unbreakable, and two lenses cost 45 guineas. In America, where the new look is popular, lenses cost 75 pounds. The inside surface of the lens is ground first, a delicate operation demanding a fine degree of precision. The instruments measure accuracy, determining if the lens fulfills its optometric prescription. Then the tiny eyeglass receives a final button. There's still a spectacle case to be lying about, but of course it's smaller, just to see how to combine. Lenses are fitted, minor adjustments are made, then a buffer solution is placed on the eyeballs as the lenses are inserted. Contact lenses can be worn for about six to eight hours without discomfort. Slight haziness mm. after this time can be remedied by removing the lenses for a few minutes. Contact lenses, invisible and comfortable. A new look that's here to stay. Pretty wild, huh? Uh, I, th I thought that was really, really amusing. So we're uh, we're not so uh, advanced as we may think we are. But we can talk for a minute about impression molding as it stands now. Uh, we usually reserve this for, you know, very regular, very ectatic, asymmetric uh, 
the regular coin is asymmetric squares. And, and truthfully, a lot of these people that we mold have seen the value of square lenses. Maybe they've been filled out fit elsewhere, but just not right, um, not, not the fit and comfort they need. So we, we turn to impression molding. You get 10 million data points in the scan from the mold, and this gets condensed down to uh, you know, several hundred thousand uh, as it actually goes to the lathes. So the, this technique and, and this technology is great, you know, for a very precise fit, which you require when you have blebs, uh, maybe tube chunks that you don't want to impinge on, large pterygia. Uh, it, it's a really great technique. We don't worry about, you know, the vertical and the horizontal and flattening and steepening because, you know, we, we go to a mold uh, come by, by taken directly from the eye. Uh, the, the solution, the plastics have, have come a long way. It's ophthalmic grade polyvinyl siloxane. Um, and these lenses, once you make them, they're fully customizable. We can make them multifocals. We can decenter the optical zone. I, I, had that, I had a case like that recently. We can put prism uh, up to four doctors in any direction. Uh, and so you get a lot of, a lot of um, flexibility in these, and, and they fit really well. Problem is, of course, they're a little bit more expensive. Uh, than the tr conventional scurl lenses. And so we use them in cases like this, really high, very proud graphs uh, that are would be hard to fit any any other way. And it's a lot more comfortable for the patient too, as we'll see. Uh, but you get a nice, you can see here, you got a nice even landing, no compression, no impingement, uh, and nice clearance. Guy still has a, a pretty good Munson sign, <laughs> you know, with that proud graph, but he's very, very happy. So from this photo, you can see how the lens is, is irregular in, in a sense, uh, but made ex to exact specifications uh, according to our mold. It's very, very comfortable, easy to do. And this is how we do it in the, in the modern era. Uh, now I'm, I have the luxury of having great staff, and uh, you, I have two of them doing it. It's just easier, and, and it's easier for the patient. We just lie them down, have them fixate. And this sets up uh, in about about three minutes, and then it's removed from the eye. It's a great technique when you're trying to fit a very ectatic or regular cornea. Instead of putting on two or three different trial lenses, take one good mold and you're done. So here's an example of uh, of that cornea that you saw uh, in the first slide, and you can see the the, the scleral curvature, scleral elevation is is quite different. You can see that the limbus is highly irregular, cornea is highly irregular. And notice all the lumps and bumps uh, that we have in here. Look at, look at these little areas here, down in here. You see how this is very, very irregular. A little, little bump there, which flares out. So really, really great. Um, you get the true shape, you get the real shape, and the lenses fit really well. And then if modifications are uh, necessary, you don't have to remold them. Once this is scanned into the database uh, of the laboratory, then you can sit there and modify it and they can make you a new lens. Let's spend just a minute on just some examination tips. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you out there are pretty experienced fitters uh, at this point, but uh, just some basic techniques let's talk about here. All right, so there we go. So, you know, here's, here's the technique. You want to dim the room lights, including your PC monitor to minimize these reflections. You angle your uh, optical beam about your optic section about 40 degrees. You know, use white light. Remember that we're looking at the fluorescein layer, the post lens tear layer with fluorescein, but we examine it in white light. And don't use too much magnification. Too little, and you're not gonna see the detail, but too much, you're not gonna see the overall picture. And of course, this is what we wanna look at. We wanna look at the lens itself, we want to look at the post lens tear layer and then the cornea. So an alternative angle is you move your light source to the over to the other side and, and just reverse the position of the oculars um, and the, uh, the light source. And then you swing around and you'll see it from a different angle. And this sometimes will reveal you know, a much different picture for you. So in the first picture, the light source is to the side, and your oculars are looking straight on. And in the second picture, you just reverse the two. So it's a good technique, and I'm just remind you if you're not doing that. 
we all hear about rat and filters, you know, we need to use a rat and filter to excite, you know, the postal tear layer, the floor seam there. And this is kind of what you want to see. You want to see uh, some iris detail. You want to see a pupillary detail, not too much, not too little floor seam. And you want to be sure to clear the limbus and so forth. We do use a rat and filter. Uh, it's a number 12 rat and filter. If you search for rat and filters, you'll find there's a bunch of different ones. And the ones we use uh, is the number 12 rat. And I remember um, way back in the late 80s when Boston uh, released the Boston Equal Lens, which was one of the first large, larger diameter, uh, still a corneal um, RGP. But in the in the fitting set, they include a rat and filter. And I think I, I didn't know what to do with it. I kind of looked at it, played with it, and forgot about it. But they're very, very useful you know, in scleral lens fitting. So I urge you to you urge you to get one. A lot of the fitting sets we get nowadays come with it, so don't throw it away. And of course, we want to look at the uh, the post lens tear layer compared to the thickness of the lens. So all our fitting sets will be labeled with the thickness of the trial lenses. So you want to keep that in mind when examining it. And in most cases, you look for a one to one ratio. Stephen Vincent and his team down in Brisbane, Florida, uh, Florida uh, Australia, sorry, Steve, uh, found uh, that the central clearance decreased an average of about 76 microns over eight hours. But 50 percent of this occurred within the first 45 minutes. So when you first put the trial lens on and, and say, well, this looks acceptable, note, note the post lens tear layer thickness compared to the, the thickness of the, of the lens itself. Uh, I send them off and let them do some other testing and, and scheduling and some information. And I see them back and then notice the difference. How much has that lens settled in 30 to 45 minutes? And you can you can be assured that it's going to do that once again over the next few hours. So, And then as Steady indicated that over two hours, 75% reduction in uh, that tier layer is going to occur. And this is why on follow-up visits, we always schedule our patients back in the late morning or early afternoon and, and tell them, instruct them that they need to be wearing their lens at least four hours when they come in to see us. Excellent article in the contact lens and interior eye. Something that is um, not new, but we get asked about this uh, fitting scleral lenses all the time. Do I need an OCT? And my answer, uh, for those of you who've, who've know me and have heard me speak, is that I think OCTs are an important part of the modern optometric practice. And there's so many things, obviously, following glaucoma, um, you know, macular puckering, macular degeneration, uh, all these different things. Uh, I think it is. Uh, I think it's part of it. It's nice to have four scar lids fitting, and I'll show you. And my good friend, Ken Pullum, who, who really is a pioneer in this, and of course, those of you who are familiar with him, he's been doing this since the late 70s, or early 80s, and, and he has, he's a funny with his quips, and he says, an OCT is overly complicated technology. Uh, he's making fun of us and says, yeah, you can just examine the eye and look at it. There's a number of different products. Um, they're all real good. You know, they all work. So if you're thinking about getting an OCT, you know, examine what's out there. And I want to thank my friend uh, Ed Boschnick down in Florida, who does amazing things. Uh, and I've learned a lot from Ed, and, and I hope he's listening tonight. But he sent me this picture. Now, this is a great picture, OCT picture, of his scleral lens fit over the entire you know, cornea out to the sclera. However, unfortunately, uh, we're denied this now because uh, this unit is no longer on the market. Uh, hopefully, there's some others uh, coming to market, and, and I'll be sharing that with you in just a minute. So too bad you can't get that. You can get this. This is my picture uh, of uh, the anterior segment. I'm not using this type of picture to um, fit a contact lens, but to see what's going on with the with the cornea. You can see this person, if you look to the right, under the little blue box, you know, has an intact. And so it makes for an interesting picture. To get this on my unit, you have to use these little auxiliary lenses. You pop these on. Uh, over the, the lens where the patient is, is looking in, and you'll get the, pig, the picture that we just saw. It's okay. It's, you know, it's not great. But, uh, and you can, this is um, also, now this is not with that little picture. This is an anterior segment. Um, I will show you how to take this in, in just a second. This is what they call uh, the global view. 
and you can see I, I got some work to do on this fit. You can see that uh, it's riding up nasally and the lens is being decentered a little bit temporally. Uh, but it's a pretty good picture and I get you know, to let you know what's going on. So I have an OCT. I use it. I like it. Um, and it's good for documentation as in this picture here. And it's nice for confirming, you know, what you're seeing at the soot lamp. And I always, when I take OCTs, you know, I look, I try to not prejudice myself. I'm, I'm looking at the patient. I'm writing down what I think the trial lens is um, and what I think it's settled to. And then I'll look at the OCT later for confirmation of what I'm seeing. And that's a learning. It's a learning tool. So say you're looking at the slit lamp and you go, what's that little spot? You know, what's that little area I'm seeing there? Well, it's nice to have an OCT. You can look at it and go, well, something going on with the epithelium there. Not sure what, but we think we ought to address it. So it's a useful tool. I like it. Uh, it's great for looking at the landings, you know, the different areas of the eye. So if you have one, use it. If you don't have one, get it, but get it for all the right reasons. Now, people will write me or call me and say, they'll look at pictures like we just looked at and they'll say, how do you do this, Tom? My, my, I, my, mine doesn't look like this or so forth. And, and so here's some illustrations of, of what, the way we do it on our unit. Uh, we use the, uh, the anterior segment five line raster. And this is similar to what you use when you're looking at uh, macular scans. Uh, we're looking for swelling or edema or detachments where you look at the macula. But this is the anterior segment version. And you see you have five cuts and you can click between the different cuts. So um, here's a tip that I learned from uh, Barry Iden, who's been doing this stuff a long time. And is a, is a great keratoconus expert, along with his team up in Chicago. He, he said, well, don't, don't just do the horizontal. We know that most cones, many cones are, are displaced. They're displaced uh, inferiorly in some manner. So you may not be seeing the highest point of the cone um, in, in the, your horizontal scans. So turn them vertically, turn them 90 degrees, and do a vertical five-line scan and make sure that you are you know, getting the clearance you want over the peak of the cornea. And this is how you use the same, same scan to get the edge profile. Now, you know, purists will say, well, when you're, if you're changing the positions of gaze, then you're, you know, you're really not looking at the true relationship of the haptic. And I think it's very valid, and I, I, I think that's a valid statement. But it gives you some idea. You're going to be close, and I just think it helps with your overall evaluation. So here's a little bit of close-up of that vertical scan. What we mean, what we mean by that. Now here's a newer generation of uh, OCT, which has a wider field. Uh, Dottie Fidel from Rome uh, allowed me to use this, and I'm very grateful to her. But it's a great image, similar to the one that that Ed had earlier. And this is very interesting. Uh, Dottie is just one of those brilliant doctors who uh, publishes a lot, designs her own scleral lenses. And uh, it's, it's becoming well known, we'll talk about this in a minute, that the, the limbus is not circular. It's, it's more elliptical in shape. And often the vertical uh, cord of the cornea is shorter than the horizontal cord, or maybe vice versa. But typically it's, it's shorter vertically. So you can see here the, the cord cut is the, is the same it's uh you know nine little over uh nine millimeters up uh and then but you see that vertically the cord is if you look at the cord at 90 it's 10 and a half millimeters if you look at it 180 it's uh um, 11 11.58 so you know it's more than one millimeter difference there so these kind of units will help you kind of ascertain that and it helps your fitting so this is a uh um, ortho K scurl lens that Dottie designed, uh, and it, you know, this is a great instrument to have. Uh, here it is looking at the edge, and, and I think you'll agree with me. Uh, these are very beautiful pictures. If you look up at the little cube in the upper right, you can see where that scan is taken. But guess what? Not in, U not in the U.S. yet. Uh, this particular unit comes out of Italy, and it's not FDA approved, but uh, it's definitely on the, on the wish list. All right, let's talk about tomography. Let's talk about shine fluid imaging. Um, many of you may have heard of this, but tomography is different than topography because tomography is a method of producing a three-dimensional image of something that's solid like the human body. 
So it's a camera system. It's not dependent on the reflection of a tear film. And the advantage of it, one of the many advantages, is you get true elevation data and you get global pachymetry because we're looking at the, the cornea as a whole and we're doing depth uh, measurements through it. So I started doing shine fluke imaging about three years ago when I really started seeing many, many patients with keratoconus and managing them. Because uh, another thing, going back to the illusion of knowledge, a quote by Stephen Hawking is, when you fit a lot of scar lenses and you get enthusiastic like I do, it's easy to concentrate on the lens, you know, fitting the lens and, and all the things we talk about. And, and kind of forget that there's an underlying health concern underneath. So we need to be looking at the cornea, looking at progression, looking at swelling, uh, all these different things. So we're managing a disease process. And so shine fluke imaging uh, can help us with that. I remember in um, optometry school learning about shiner disc. And so I was kind of interested in you know, how, how old that was, 17th century, quite a, quite a while ago. So Shiner was, you know, measuring marbles, you know, looking at the reflection uh, on the surface of a marble. But Placido's disc, you know, came around in the 19th century, and that's really was withstood the test of time because most all topographers work on that principle uh, of that concentric ring of, of or circle of black and white rings from the uh, anterior surface. So, you know, most topographers look like this. They use Placido disc, different scan heads, different sizes, and, and they're fine. Uh, you know, we've all had one. I've had one for years. But when you get with these real difficult corneas, the problem is the tear film, you know, can be very unstable and lead to poor images. I mean, we're looking at dry eyes. We're looking at graft versus host disease, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and just a real hepatic cornea like some of the ones we saw earlier. So it's difficult to image. And remember that we're not fitting the cornea per se. We want to get over the cornea. We're fitting the sclera. And also they're not going to give you the global pachymetry. So they have a place, but the shine plug is, you know, is a camera system. And if you see the little segments, if you look right in the, the upper part where it has these different segments, there's 25 different slices. The camera takes 25 different slices, rotates around, and only takes two seconds. Uh, this image is the first image I showed you after the impression mold of the very high, the very proud graft. And, and the problem with uh, topography is that when you have this non-planar surface uh, that really falls away from, from the apex, you know, you just, you don't get accurate results. And so that's why the shine plug is, uh, is a very useful tool. And so this would be, you know, shine plug, shine plug, yeah, KSSO, you know, what does this mean? Well, this is a this is a example of, of the data you get. You get your topography just as you would with the Placido disk system, and those maps can be anything you want, tangential, uh, you know, axial. You get the overall pachymetry, and you get the anterior elevation, which is very important fitting scar lenses. That's that's the challenge is to get over that or align to that. But you also get posterior elevation because we know in progressive keratoconus. A lot of what's happening is on the posterior surface. So it's really nice to be able to image that. So who is Scheinflug? I, I like history, and I thought, Scheinflug, Scheinflug. Well, who is Scheinflug? So I looked him up. So Theodore Scheinflug was this Austrian army captain who, who worked extensively on this uh, method of, of correcting photographs that were skewed. And what his job was, he was in the uh, Austrian military before World War I. And uh, he actually uh, did his work before the war and, and tragically died a little bit before World War I started. But he was tasked with flying over what would become the enemy lines and taking pictures, you know, of all the, the troop movements and the, the trenches and so forth. And he's flying around taking pictures. And, of course, the earth is going to fall away uh, and it's going to lead to, uh, you know, unfocused images. So when he has the subject plane that's falling away, and it's not aligned with his lens plane or his image plane, uh, then you then you only get good focus right in the, in the middle of the image and the, and the peripheral part is blurred. So he developed somehow a method of, of bringing these together. He, he found a tangent 
and brought these images to a, to a common intersection. And that's how he straightened out the image. And so uh, it's a camera system where the object, um, the subject, and the lens plane are all, all in line, and you get a good focus. So this is what we call shine fluke imaging. There's several different products on the market that have this, but they all have this common feature. So another picture of different segments. And, you know, when you have advanced keratoconus, it's really nice to be able to see you know, what, what really is going on with the cornea. And if you look in the center part of, of the cornea here, center right, center left, you see how it's very white. When you see white, that's um, reflected, that's scarring. So you can really kind of look and, and get a, a, a global view real quickly about, well, how well is this person going to see in a contact? I mean, is the scar lens appro appropriate or is it's got too much scarring? It's going to scatter the light resulting in the poor, poor image. So it gives you a real heads up. So uh, very, very useful tool. And also now on the unit I have, they have a really unique um, system developed by um, Michael Bellin and Renato Ambrosio. It's called the BAD display. It is bad, you know. Any Michael Jackson fans out there? So what, what the BAD uh, does is it takes that most ectatic region of the cornea. The cornea is really out of normal range, and it takes it out from the elevation map. And this prevents smoothing and leveling of that map. And so that ectatic region really pops out. You can see, well, what, how does this compare with the normal, the normal region of the cornea? In addition, it, it calculates six separate indices and then computes a, a global algorithm. And uh, the, the end result is something they call the D value. And if it's greater than three, then you're pretty assured that this is an abnormal cornea. So this is, this is the concept. When you have a standard best fit sphere, the best fit sphere takes the entire cornea into account. So the flat area gets steepened, the steep area gets flattened, and this is where, where you get the smoothing process. So with the bad display, it, it takes that three or four millimeter region indicated in the little red dot in the lower right, takes that out and says, OK, I'm not using that irregular region to um, you know, calculate my best fit sphere. And so as a result, the cone comes out. And so you get global pechymetry, as you see up there in the upper right. You get the front elevation, the back elevation and then the difference between those, and that shows your tannic region. You get a corneal thickness spatial profile. And what that means is how much does the corneal thickness change over time or, or change from the center to the periphery. And you can see here it starts out so thin, uh, it, it doesn't get normal until it hits you know, almost eight millimeters out. And then you have percentage thickness increase too, and you can see that the red lines don't fall within you know, normal values. And the little the little global indices I was telling you about are on the very bottom there. And that's the front curvature, the back curvature, the pachymetry, the thickness and all that. And the little global the D value is is highlighted there off the right. And this is 27, right? When we talked about anything over three <laughs> is abnormal. So uh, this is uh, this is the cornea of the last uh, shine flu image I showed you with the scarring. All right. So, you know, we have a lot of talk about keratoconus, keratoconus, oh, pellucid, pellucid. And, and uh, I think my personally, I've misunderstood this for many years. So let's talk about that. And what's in your chair? Is it keratoconus? Uh, is it pellucid? You know, is, is that important? This young guy's probably too young to have either. But uh, he might ask you, hey, doc, do I have PMD? I think a lot of you uh, would agree that the kissing does or the lobster claw that we see here, uh, that's that's PMD. Look, look at the rate of change down the bottom. Uh, certainly, that's what I thought in, until really just a few years ago. But that's not the definition of PMD. So it's not kissing does. It's not lobster claw. All right. And again, we uh, Michael Bellin's uh, written about this. Remember that curvature, which is what axial maps, tangential maps measure, uh, that's a reference base. And so you get these asymmetric patterns 
in possibly a normal cornea when the apex, the line of sight, and the measurement axis don't line up. So it's a normal variant, uh, it not indicated of any particular pathology. And so, as, as Bellin says, it's often misdiagnosed. And this is from the Pentacam Interpretation Guide. And so this is PMD. This is where you have that band of inferior thinning uh, along the margin. And, and of all our patients, I've been doing this about six years, uh, not as long as, as, as some of the some of the people out there. But I only have, in all the cases I've done of keratoconus, I only have this guy and one other that really have PMD. So it's it's quite um, it's quite rare actually. And so here's the um, axial map that we just looked at, and look at his corneal thickness. So certainly it's a low, almost temporal cone, but it's not that band of thinning. So uh, don't be misled. And you know, does it really matter? Eh, probably not. Although keratoconus tends to arrest itself in the late 20s, early 30s, and uh, PMD seems to go on, and um, you have changes later in life. So it, it is an important diagnosis. Any chess players out there? I, uh, I used to play a lot of chess in college, and you know, stress reliever, I like it. Got to watch out for the queen. She can do anything she wants. Okay, let's talk about the limbus again. We looked at Dottie's uh, excellent OCTs. And the sclera is not symmetrical. Uh, it's highly, highly asymmetrical, as is the limbus. This is an excellent, excellent paper. And if you didn't read it, I urge you to get it. Uh, it's published by a number of friends of mine who are all brilliant. Uh, and as you see, it, it, uh, it's the assessment of corneal sh scleral shape, or not corneal, scleral shape patterns using uh, an L wide spectrum wide surface elevation topographer. And uh, do read it. It's very, very good. And this is the results of, of that study. They had 140 patients. Only 6%, not even 6%, had a scleral shape that you could describe as spherical. Uh, only a little less than 29% were toric regular, meaning that it was against the rule sclera or, or with the rule sclera in a regular pattern. The vast majority, almost two-thirds, were irregular with asymmetric high and low points or a periosity different than 180. That means it wasn't steeper horizontally than vertically or vertically than horizontally. It wasn't even oblique. There was, there was no discernible pattern to it. And so we wonder why scarlet lenses are so hard to fit. Why do they decenter? Uh, why do I get bubbles under this? You know, And this is why. It, the sclera itself is irregular. Part of the reason why is the circle of Tolo where the extraocular muscles are at, inserted at different distances from the limbus. And the other reason, I, I don't have it here in the slide, but the other reason is the scar is very, very uh, straight. It, it's, it's not curved like the cornea. Once you get off the limbus onto the sclera, it's a very straight or what we call tangent surface. And so um, the lens has to fit that. A couple of illustrations of the technique, a couple of the units. Uh, you do use fluorescein in these units, and you're looking at the elevation maps, okay? Remember that in elevation maps, blue is below the plane uh, of the best fit sphere. In this case, the best fit sphere is reference to the sclera. So blue means it's steeper, not flatter, as in axial maps or tangential maps. And then red would be above the plane. So that's your flatter region. So remember to reverse the, uh, reverse the colors in your mind, if you will. Uh, and so this is uh, indicative. This is from Greg Denier, one of the authors of that study. And I appreciate the slide, Greg. And you can this is what we mean by different asymmetrical high points. So this is a we would call this a, a with the rule scleral shape in that it's steeper vertically, flatter horizontally. But notice that the two high points uh, are, are not there's 200 microns difference, even though they're both. Uh, the steeper meridian. So this is why scurls are sometimes very challenging to fit, and we get into controversies. Well, how big should the lens be? Do we need toric haptics? Do I need quadrant-specific haptics? You know, we get in all these controversies and, and conundrums because well, we're fitting a very irregular surface. Another another product here uh, shows the same thing: the steeper and and the flatter meridians here. Uh, the cornea is the central little circle in the middle. 
and everything out there is, is sclera. Uh, this is a unit that doesn't require fluorescein. It's using the shine fluid technology where again, it's taking uh, the scans um, and it, it you know, does a pretty good job of, of getting out there. You see nasally, uh, temporally on the bottom, uh, superior inferiorly on the top and they're color coded to the little um, little color um, illustration in the in the center lower center area there so different instruments all trying to do the same thing and there's a few pictures of them I'm sure at any any show you go to you can talk to the vendors and they'll be happy to demonstrate this and they have a database of scroll lenses which really makes them useful and that is you can you, know, you select your favorite design and the profilometer will say well if you're going to use this lens then i would start with this sagittal depth and the haptic ought to be like this so uh, another example you have your scan you have your data and you look to the left and, and there's a it scrolls down and you can you know there's a number of different lenses not just these you can pick what lens you like and click on it and it'll give you the suggestions so I think the ultimate goal, I think for all of us, is to go to empirical fitting, you know, uh, to upload, to take those scans and just upload it to the to the lab and just say, make me a lens like this. Uh, they will fit right the first time or they're going to be really, really close without the need of going through trials. You don't have to disinfect the trials. Uh, you don't have to put them on and off and try different ones. Um, you have to come out with a, a prescription which they can probably do from a manifest spectacle RX or better yet, and this is how we do uh, with the impression molding. We just put any RGP lens, just something to stick on the eye, known base curve, known power, and just over refract that. And with that calculation, they can make you a lens. So no trial sets, right? No expense, no maintenance, no lost lenses or broken lenses, uh, you know, or you end up with something like this. <laughs> these are, these are our trial sets. Now these are, you know, some of these are betas, some of these are old. I don't use all these, obviously. Um, but, you know, this is what you end up with. So uh, nobody has room for that. All right. Well, we can do all this work. We can do all this analysis. We've got this all this great equipment. And if the patient can't get this in their eye, then, uh, you know, that's kind of all for naught, isn't it? So how do we help the patients get this thing in their eye? Uh, Brian Tompkins uh, in uh, Northampton, UK, was very nice to make me a slide illustrating this with, with one of his staff. And, you know, it's a patients and even some practitioners, when we first look at scar lenses, they look like this. They don't look much different. They look like, how am I going to put this pizza pie in my eye? Well, there's a number of devices out there that you can use. A little handheld device with a little plunger unit kind of gives you something to hang on to, a little bit larger. So that's one, uh, one option. Another one uh, by a young man, uh, Dr. Fayez Magoub, who came up with a really interesting design. This little unit telescopes. You can, um, you know, a rank, you can stand up and use it or put it on a table. It's got its own light source. Uh, the battery goes in the central tube. There's a little uh, on-off button on the bottom. You use a DMV that uh, has a hole in it and it shines right up. And pretty, um, I think, it, I don't know if these are on the market yet, but he's certainly going to develop it. Uh, we've all used the CMV or the C green um, inserter. There's several variations of this. Uh, we have a couple of these in the office. Sometimes people buy these. Again, it's got a light source and whatever it takes you know, to get it in the eye. And yeah, you know, some people have handling issues. Uh, maybe they have rheumatoid arthritis or they've lost some fingers or you know, who, who knows what. Maybe they have Parkinsonism. So this is very, very useful. But you know, you can always be creative, and uh, we call this the truck stop inserter. You take your styrofoam cup and uh, punch a hole in it, and make sure your DMV has a hole in it as well, and uh, so it doesn't, you know, doesn't retain the lens. And use that works well. And you can get really creative. A patient of mine, in fact, I saw him like yesterday, and uh, we call this the handyman inserters. And uh, some of you handyman and handy women out there uh, will recognize these are wire nuts used to tie two uh, two electrical wires together and I said well that's fine just make it, sure you clean them with alcohol uh, and uh, they work you can't deny it uh, and this illustrates I'll point out that you want to overfill the lens you want a positive meniscus to uh, reduce the bubbles in there so anyway so that's that 
So uh, we sell, you know, just so people have them, we make up this multi-pack and give them a discount. All right, for the couple minutes I have left, what's in the future, right? Well, Sex Pistols came out uh, when I was in optometry school, so I always had an affection for the Sex Pistols. But anyway, Johnny Rotten did pretty well. He married some heiress in, in the UK worth millions of pounds, and uh, I think uh, his future turned out pretty, pretty, pretty good for him. But one thing that we hear a lot about, 3D printing. Is it, is it real? You know, somebody thinks so. Uh, Johnson Johnson, a couple years ago, uh, several years ago, almost three years, was talking about, you know, printing their soft lenses. And uh, they were working on this. I haven't heard much about this uh, lately, but it's something that some of you think about. And I did run across this. Here's a, a student in New Zealand who is a psychology major. I mean, he's a psychology student who had a friend with uh, epilepsy and, and he was light sensitive. So he said, well, maybe I can come up with a contact lens with some sort of polarization uh, and work on it. And he did. He won a prize down in New Zealand. He got 5,000 uh, New Zealand dollars. And he got a scholarship for this. Um, kind of makes me feel inadequate. Here's a, here's a college student making lenses, you know, in his dorm room. Uh, eye printing them. So, you know, I mean, that could happen with scarlet lenses. There's no denying it. Another innovation, uh, Melissa Barnett uh, drew, drew our attention to uh, earlier this year about drug releasing contacts. Now, this is soft, but, you know, there's no reason why this, you know, maybe couldn't be applied to a scarlet lens. So, scientists there in, in China have developed a lens that releases the drug into the eye and it changes color as it does so. But as it says here in the last sentence, but only in the area of the iris, not in the pupil. So there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there. Now, multifocal lenses. OK, you know, it, it's a challenge. Uh, I fit them um, and sometimes I have success and sometimes I don't. But, uh, you know, it'd be nice if I didn't have to struggle with it. How about eye drops? Well, there's several things out there. One that gives a pinhole effect, meiosis without accommodation. Uh, it says it's fairly comfortable. The last eight hours gives a five line improvement in the visual acuity. Uh, Dr. Habash down in uh, Miami told me about that. Uh, you know, this may be a way to way to go. Sometimes it'd be nice if we could just make them not presbyopic uh, by use of a pinhole effect. The other the other avenue of attack is softening the lens. Uh, we talk a lot about cross linking the cornea. Well, this is a, a product. Uh, of lipoic acid that anti-cross links collagen and uh, it allows the natural lens to remain more elastic and it may even help reduce the progression of, of cataracts so um, you, know, you wouldn't want to do this in someone that probably that you cross linked for the cornea but it might be something to consider uh, for others uh, to improve you know, their near vision and it's in clinical trials and you know, Dick Lindstrom is very influential in the anterior segment cataract world and, and, and refractive world and he's you know talking about doing some studies on that so it's pretty interesting and so i appreciate the sls inviting me tonight and and having me uh, do this presentation i hope you've enjoyed it the scarlet lens society is uh, one of the sponsors of our fourth annual international congress of scleral contacts that that uh, drew mentioned when we started this this will be a great meeting it's going to be two days it's in Florida, uh, there at Fort Lauderdale. And uh, with that, uh, these are my contact information. People visit me all the time. People write me. Uh, very, very happy to talk to you. Uh, Nick Rumney says hi from the UK. Oh, and join the Scarlet Lens Practitioners on Facebook. Nate, Nate Schramm uh, started this a few years ago, and I'm, I'm one of the admins. So get on Scarlet Lens Practitioners. Great group of people, and uh, you'll learn a lot. And as we say in Scotland, that's me. And uh, I think, uh, Drew, I'll let you take over and uh, tell us about the upcoming webinar series. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, this one question before we wrap up here. Um, talk a little bit about your threshold for when you go from a uh, diagnostically fit lens to a molded fit lens. What kind of makes you make that jump? 
from a standard scleral to a uh, custom molded design? Um, that's a great question. A couple different reasons. Many of them, uh, many patients are referred in by other doctors who, uh, uh, you know, the patient has tried sclerals and they're just not getting the fit or comfort or vision they want. They've tried several and they just, you know, want to take it the next step and, and, and you know, achieve the best they can. Uh, others are people that are just, you look at them and they're so ectatic that you go, you know, you just say, you say to him, look, I can work on this. I can probably make it work, but it's going to take a lot of visits. And, you know, your cornea is very difficult. Uh, I think you'll have a much better chance of a quicker outcome. And it ultimately saves you time and money, uh, especially, you know, we draw patients from, from great distances sometimes. And they can't, this can't keep coming back, you know, especially a difficult case. So a lot of them are, are what I call Skirlin's failures, but they still want it to work and they just want the best technology out there. Uh, the others are, you know, come from a long way and just, you know, need to get it done with expediently. Um, and others are just, like I said, they, they have a big bleb or they have a shunt uh, or some real, you know, some, something really unusual. And you just say this is the best option for you. So uh, it's, it's a good question. And sometimes they think about it and come back. Uh, I have a number of patients. And this is interesting. I'm glad for the question. That they only really need this impression mold on, on one eye. And the other eye can be fit with a, a regular lens, you know, like a, a commonly available lens. And, and uh, they do that because it's the right thing to do. And it's more cost effective. But I tell you what, uh, Lots of times they'll come back, you know, uh, during the fitting process or, or at the next exam, six months or something, and they'll say, yeah, I know, I know I don't have to have it in my, quote, good eye, but it, but the, this, this, this impression lens feels so much better, I want one over here, too. So they end up getting a pair. And then uh, to, to dovetail off that last question, I, we, I know on a COPE approved lecture we can't get too specific on costs, but what is sure. the, kind of the general difference in cost between impression molded and regular? And then uh, yeah. how many, uh, what, what's kind of the difference in, in return visits and, and fits for uh, impression molded versus kind yeah. of standard scleral lenses? Yeah, great question. Uh, it costs about maybe 40% more, you know, you know, about 40% more. Um, uh, we give them a little bit longer um, follow-up period, you know, just because it is more expensive. Uh, there are more difficult eyes. Uh, but I would say it really cuts down on the return visits. Uh, typically, you know, for, for one of my average patients who, you know, all these people are challenging by definition. That's why they're in scarls. And I may see we have a 90-day fit window, you know, for typical patients. For eye print patients, we give them 120 days. Uh, of impression molding. And um, a typical patient that, you know, is challenging but not terrible, I'll see I'll see them four to six times within that 90 days because you got dispense and then two week follow up and so forth. Um, and with the with the impression molding, you know, maybe you see them twice, three times, maybe four, uh, but it, it's less. It's really it's really less. And 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 lots of times the changes that you that you need to do if you need to do a change is really minimal. You know, it's really just a tweak. Uh, they're not off by much. And and usually if they're off by anything, it's usually the RX. You know, that you have to tweak the RX, not the fit. They love the comfort. And the name of that people, company, people, the comfort is is just amazing. Yeah. The name of the company is iPrint Pro, I believe. Is that correct? That is correct. We have some questions about the name of that company. Lakewood, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And that's the website, iPrintPro.com. Perfect. Um, we've got a couple requests for uh, Dr. Arnold's email. If he's okay with it, we'll include that in the follow-up email that goes out to everybody tomorrow. Uh, sure. And I had one last question. Let me find it again. Oh, the, the systems that recommend uh, initial starting lenses based on measurements and scleral topography, are they becoming more inclusive of, of uh, a variety of lenses? Are they pretty specific for a certain design? They vary. It, it depends on the brand. Um, some some have a wider range. Others are more narrow. Um, I, you know, so you have to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's three major vendors out there doing that. Very good. I think that's all we have. 
Um, um, and I think that'll about do it. So thank you to uh, Dr. Arnold. Thank you to everybody who helped with the webinar. And thank you to all who attended. We'll uh, talk to you all in a few months. Have a good night.